Okay. All right, thanks everybody. So what we're going to do is uh, try and have a very interactive time together because our goal is to make sure that we get what's on your mind and make sure that we know what it is you'd like to talk about. Here's what we're going to start with. Quick intro of ourselves, better for everybody to do their own thing. And then I've got one question that I'm going to ask each of these leaders on stage and I'm going to go straight to you. So I'm Steve. I've set up a team called SG Innovate. We are wholly owned by Singapore government. We're trying to straddle private sector and public. So it's a private company set up, but it's held by Singapore government. Our goal is to help fund and support and scale deep tech related startups from Singapore that would like to grow to the world. Bay? I feel like I have to counter that. So we are not owned by the government. We are a private company. Uh, our name is Brink.io. We help build and accelerate hardware innovation. So we have accelerators all around the world. We have a studio in mainland China. So you can actually get your products designed, developed, manufactured. And we have growth and online teams to help actually ship those products and grow distribution, which I'm excited to talk about today. Great. Steve. I'm also Steve, but I also don't work for the government. Um, I'm the, uh, <laughs> the co <laughs> I'm the co-founder of uh, Property Guru. So we are Southeast Asia's leading online property group. Uh, we're used by 23 million people every month to try and find their dream home. Uh, we're responsible for about $15 billion of transactions every year across the platform. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, interacting with you later on. Laura. Yeah, my name is Laura. I run a company called Shippo. We simplify shipping for e-commerce. Right now, we're roughly 70 people based out of our San Francisco office. We've been doing this for four-ish years now. In the last year, we've seen through more skill than usual on the team side. So we grew our team from 25 to 70-ish people now. And I'm excited to share stories about that. OK, so what I'm going to do is uh, I've got a question that I'd like to ask each of the founders, leaders, and then I'm going to go to you. So give you a little bit of time to think about it. Laura, let me start off with you. When you think about hiring talent, you have to always think about who's got the new and crazy ideas, who's thinking of things that are not bound by tradition. But at the same time, you need people that have experience and know what they're doing as you scale. So help me understand what it is that you think about in those two ways. Yeah. I, I love that question because it's a very interesting one for us. First of all, like it's about the seniority of leaders, but then on our end, it's also about whether or not our leadership team has shipping experience. Mm -hmm. Shipping is a very traditional uh, space to be in, and there is not a lot of innovation happening, innovation happening in that space, so whether or not we want people with that proprietary knowledge coming into our team, or, or whether we want people who um, will bring in a fresh perspective but are still senior. So. When we started the company, me and my co-founder were both first-time founders. We don't have any management experience. And then after raising the Series A, it was very important for us that we build a senior leadership team to fill out the most important departments. For us, that was the go-to-market functions, so business development, marketing, customer success. And given that we're a tech company, of course, also engineering. It was also important to us that a product stays with, it a, fo with a founder, given that the two of us still had that, um, like the, the product vision. And we felt like it was best for that to remain with us for a longer while. Mm -hmm. So um, we, directly after raising the A, that was my main priority, building out that management team and having people in place who've done this for at least 10 years. The interesting aspect here is that we did not hire from the shipping space. So all of the leaders we hired were e-commerce leaders mostly, or like have been in e-commerce in the past, but we wanted people to come in, bring a fresh perspective, the perspective from our customers who are e-commerce stores versus the traditional perspective of the shipping providers. Right now, as we um, keep scaling the team, we're starting to introduce more level of hierarchies, which is another interesting thing as like me and my co-founder become managers of managers, that's the next challenge. <laughs> All right, so uh, Bay. Your team thinks about helping companies be global. When you think about global, some people think about, let's open in a lot of places. I want to try and be known in a lot of places. Some people think, dominate your, your local neighborhood and scale. How does Brink think about this, or the teams that you work with? So because we do physical products, there's a little bit of a difference here. And I was in the Valley for almost 10 years, so moving to Asia is a perfect counterpart of the brain you have to have to think about this. Because as a physical company, you don't have the ability to stay local. You just cannot. The entire physical world is competing with you, and when you're doing a physical product, especially when we do electronics, day one you put that website up, you're competing with Apple, Samsung, Huawei. That doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter how small you think you are, you're competing with the big guys instantly. Now, the mistake people, people make is two sides. They make the mistake of thinking that they can only do e-commerce, BS, 
and they also think that they should scale super fast to every single market, and they want to get distributors in like 10 different countries. Their crowdfunding campaigns ship to like 97 countries in their first crowdfunding campaign or something. All those things stress a startup in a way that's not reasonable in the early days. So we try to be more thoughtful and figure out what are the logical countries you should be in, both online and offline, work with a couple of small distributors or partners, don't go to the entire retail chain, you know, target you know, nationwide in your first product. These are just sort of like basic mistakes that are just these fallacies that we see in the sort of media landscape that we try to help instill these best practices in founders early to give them a chance to become strong because they actually are yep. competing with the juggernauts immediately, and you just can't do that when you're small. You have to find where you can be strong and protect yourself, generally as commercial success, money, profit, and then actually go build and scale out later. If we have time, I'm going to have to come back on that crowdfunding question and the idea of getting something launched and getting 10,000 people that say, I want to buy your product, and then having to actually deliver it. Yep. I'd love to come back to Steve. Before we get there, uh, I'd love to learn growth consumes cash. So when you think about scaling, do you think about this idea of I want to continue to burn investor cash because I'm chasing scale because that makes me harder to beat later? Or do you want to try and do this armadillo, kind of curl up, be good, conserve cash? I know you've lived through this. What's on your mind? Well, I think from our experiences, it um, depends really on the business model and the market. But uh, in our experience, you know, uh, the, big, the big lesson is uh, don't run before you can walk. You know, so we spent the first three or four years uh, bootstrapping the company, uh, building a strong business in Singapore. We built a market leadership position in Singapore, used by about three or four million people every month, and it was a profitable business, and we raised a chunk of money, and we thought, right, now's the time to go and expand really fast, <laughs> and we almost killed the company by doing it. We uh, went from one country to four countries in four months, and um, spent the next 18 months trying to mop up the mess. Uh, <laughs> so we went from about 60, 70 staff at that stage to hiring about 230 staff uh, in a period of about six to nine months. And then, by the way, we lost about 230 staff and then had to rehire as well. Because people coming in the door, not being trained, not being coached, um, you know, we were thinking about this whole organization, which at that stage was focused just on one country, just on Singapore. And then suddenly overnight we said, right, now we want you to build Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, yeah. brand new website, mobile apps for the consumers, iOS, Android, <laughs> mobile apps for the agents, uh, <laughs> branding strategy, hiring, customer services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this Singapore organization, which was humming along, doing a great job in Singapore was suddenly pulled out into four different countries mm. and we stretched it to breaking point. Um, people who came in left, the people who were there were just, just trashed because they were working just crazy hours. And um, we spent then 18 months not just building those markets but also then repairing the damage afterwards. And so really between 2011 and 2014, three years, you know, we spent time building, repairing, and then growing again. Uh, it was a tough, tough process. So, you know, my, I guess the reason why we want to expand so fast was we raised the money to expand internationally because we built a great business in Singapore. And we felt, look, we built this business in Singapore. It's going to be really easy now to expand from Singapore to the other markets, cut and paste. In reality, in most businesses, I'm sure, but in, certainly in our case, uh, it's very local. How people look for property, what property they look for, is very, very different in Singapore than it is in Thailand and other markets. And we had to then fundamentally rethink about the product strategy. So the big lesson for us, don't run before you can walk, uh, but also keep in mind the customer and the problem you're trying to solve, uh, because it's different in every market. So if we have time, I do want to come back on this idea of how much do you raise when you're thinking about scale, and do you raise enough to try and justify pushing, or do you say, let me raise enough to get through this next stage of growth, and what's that relationship with your investors? But before we do that, uh, are there questions in the audience? Because you're here to listen to them, so is there something that you'd like to ask of anybody on the stage? Yes. Sorry, it's a little hard to see with the light. Yes, please. Is there a m microphone, please? I guess not. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Carrie from OneSky. Uh, we're an app localization and translation company, so we help businesses go global, and this is awesome intro to this session. Um, I'd love to go back to the question of your international expansion, or you know, for Shippo, if you're planning on going there. Mm -hmm. um, w at what point do you know that you are ready to go into new markets, and what are the ways that you're ensuring that you don't crash and burn, like you were describing? Thank you. Okay, 
So just because I'm going to try and rotate through as many questions as possible, I'm going to ask our esteemed panelists to just try and give a crispy answer. So, Laura, do you want to jump in and yeah. talk about when's the right time to grow to a new market? Yeah, we're a B2B company. So what we've done traditionally is um, our customers take us to new markets. We don't go into a country unless there is demand there already. So our existing customers, they expand into, for instance, from the US to Canada to the UK, and they're looking for a shipping solution there. And instead of them building something out themselves, they come to us and we make the, the promise to deliver it within a certain time frame. And now the next step for us is to then also acquire customers. Now, now that we have that integration done in those countries, to acquire customers locally as well. But we have made the decision to enter that market because there's been demand there. I want to touch this super fast. We underestimate the defensibility globally, like especially in this whole startup world, of what it means when you can integrate culture. So in the Valley in particular where I was from, I think there's this myopic perspective of like, you know, what's right. And it's like essentially having everything in near your mm -hmm. investors, like everything in one place. Our company is a nightmare to integrate. We have 11 languages from 10 countries, and guess what? That's also why we're strong and people can't compete very well with us. It's not easy, but it's massively defensible when you do figure it out. Mm -hmm. Anything else on your mind? Yes, sir. You'll have to help me out by just jumping up. I think. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, just thinking about. Um, the, the question of the managers of the managers for the first time, and then opening new offices where you might have, so you've now added layers, you've got a global strategy for marketing and sales and customer success, but now you've got local people trying to deliver that. How do you, how much emphasis do you put on autonomy in the local market versus mm -hmm. oversight of the global strategy from the HQ point of view, or you know, how do you service that um, success? So, Steve, you've scaled in a couple of countries. Yeah, I guess um, from our experiences, one, there was a, I wouldn't underestimate the challenges of going international because you've gone from one country where everything is very integrated to suddenly having to put a leadership team in place which is capable of scaling and the systems and processes for that. Um, we've gone through two iterations. So when we first launched in our various markets, it was fairly autonomous. We had a country manager uh, whose role was to go and do whatever they wanted in that market with a little bit of loose support and guidance from the, from the HQ. And, and that kind of worked initially a little bit, but the challenge we found was um, we were really asking the country manager to be like a mini CEO, mm -hmm. uh, but we weren't paying a CEO salary. <laughs> we weren't, you know, these guys weren't you know, that kind of experience. And so not surprisingly, expectations were mismatched and it didn't kind of work for us. So we've, uh, we've moved over the last two years to more of a kind of hybrid model where we have a country manager with a very local team in place, um, but it's far more functional. So we have a, you know, a CFO and the finance people in the country report to the CFO. We have a, a CTO and reports to CTO. Now those CTOs and CFOs don't necessarily need to be in Singapore. For example, our CFO is actually um, in Malaysia or our development center, we've moved it to, to, to Thailand. But you know, more functional. So we have the expertise and leadership expertise guiding and coaching the people in the country. Um, so the country manager is now far more sort of sales focused on the ground. Uh, that's working well for us. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for other other, other businesses, but it's that's how that's our lessons learned. Yes, please. While we're getting to that question, one thing also is hiring the right talent. Mm -hmm. So hiring leaders that actually have that background. So everyone that's a leader in our company has worked in multiple countries before. They're used to this lifestyle. They're mm -hmm. not just a, a guy that grew up in New York City mm -hmm. and never left New York City. Everyone mm -hmm. that's a leader in our company has lived and led in other countries. And I think that's really important as well, just from my own background, when I was running a software hardware company in Asia, the person that ran China I had to know that person, I had to know where he came from, I had to know what he was doing, and I had a CFO with whom I'd worked in another company that was also Hong Kong Chinese that knew what was what. So for me, personally, distributors and partners, so we went from less than 100 million to 600 million US in our China business because we had the right leaders, but that is a very dangerous reef if you say to somebody, Go and do, because you've been successful here, you're going to be naturally successful there. So we had Filipinos running Philippines, Chinese yeah. running China. I mean, it's obvious, but it's not obvious for a lot of companies because they go to their comfort zone. Mm. They know Fred or they know Susie, and they want to export them. Uh, was there another question? Yeah, yep. I have a question. Hi, my name is Cindy. I'm from a startup from the Philippines. What we do is, in the Philippines, we have benefits and incentives that are fairly government-regulated. 
when you don't use them, they get forfeited, but the companies actually write them off in your P&L. And so what we do is we allow the employees to shop with them, with those benefits the company pays for. Um, we raised about $5 million in our Series A, and then we, after a year, we went to Jakarta. It was the worst, uh, probably, management decision we've made so far. Um, eight months to set up, eight months to clean up the mess. Um, so, Steve, my question is more for you. Um, I couldn't relate to your, your experience. Um, after cleaning up that mess, we got better at what we did, and now we're preparing for our Series B, hopefully getting valued higher and better. But when do we tell ourselves, okay, it's time to actually go to another country? And um, in your experience, how were the investors more uh, approachable, considering we've made that mistake in the past? Yeah, I think the first thing I'd say, I, I, I do some small investing myself. And the number one uh, thing I say to them, don't feel pressurized by the investors to expand internationally. There's no point in having a business that's got like 10 pins on the map and say, look, we're, we're a global company now. <laughs> Um, my lessons and battle scars are breadth and depth in a, in, a, in a market, defensibility in a particular market before expanding. And so don't listen to investors on that perspective. You, you know when's a good time to go in. You know your business better than anybody else. Uh, for us, it was the right time to expand. It wasn't the best way of expanding. You know, we, that was our mistake, not anybody else's mistake. Um, so I think that would be my, my, uh, my response to that. In, in terms of Indonesia, Indonesia has been probably our, our toughest market. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to a number of startups and businesses who are building businesses in Indonesia. Um, and it, it tends to be, it, it's, the, it's the market of the future in future. Um, it just takes a little bit longer. And I think, uh, I think it will be our largest market in 10 years' time. Um, but we've gone through a lot of lessons learned in Indonesia. And I'll be very happy to share some, some stories if you think Indonesia is the market for you. But there may be other markets which I can also share some ideas with you. So let me just pick up very briefly on a point that Steve made indirectly, which is not every investor is the right investor for every startup. And so if an investor is pushing and it doesn't feel like it's the right relationship or the right market growth strategy or whatever else, to echo Steve's point, you don't need to do it. So sometimes people think that this investor must know more than you do. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case. So just to put in a plug, although we're also an investor, we look for that where what we can add and what the startup needs is the right balance. And it may not always be the case. And we try and find a place where they're a better fit. Another question on somebody's mind? Yes, please. Hello, my name is Tammy. My question is, how do you maintain the balance between a company culture <laughs> as well as giving the uh, individual country offices their own mm -hmm. autonomy without compromising the initial company mission? So, Laura, we were just chatting backstage <laughs> about you yeah. went from 25 to 65, and one of your thoughts is, how do I maintain the culture of this thing I'm building? Yes. You want to take that one? Yeah, so roughly a year ago, we were at a point where we decided we had to make company culture explicit. So beforehand, we were still small enough that we talked about it every day. We felt like the people we hired were on the same page. It was just something that happened implicitly. Um, then we decided to like sit down, write it down, make sure that we have them present, that they're part of the onboarding process, that we give each other praise along the lines of these values. So these days, like we have this little tradition where we give each other a hippo statue at our weekly all hands. And in order to receive that statue, like the person has to tell why that other person is, is getting it, what did that person do well in line with the values, with our values. I, as we grow the team, I think the values, like, they're going to remain the same, like, independent of the location. I think value is something we don't want to compromise on. Um, and it's, we've incorporated that within our hiring process, within the decision-making process, what kinds of team members we bring on board. It's something that is happening both top-down, but then also bottom-up. So. I know that, Bay, you've got offices in Europe and in Asia and North America. So as you stretch the distances, how do you try and make sure that people in your team continue to believe in the things that you do? Mm -hmm. Because as you stretch and as you get time zones and so on, so how do you think about that from your perspective as well? Yeah, I think there's two, two points there. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I really think it's top down. And we hire leadership, especially senior leaders that are going to open up other markets. Either they've worked in our offices with us before and then they go, which is also a kind of cool way that we've expanded is as people's lives change, we follow our leaders. 
when people want to move, we find a way to go help them open a new market naturally, mm. as long as it makes business sense. It's nice in the physical world, that's every single city on earth, right? <laughs> so the, the challenge that I find is, and I learned being a Valley guy, you know, was that when I came out here, I just got my butt handed to me when we opened up China. Because you can't just instill Western cultures wholesale in the East. Yeah. So I think that bottom up is a very interesting conversation too, but you can't afford, in my opinion, to have the local culture override your corporate culture. And I learned that at Apple because we came to, if everyone remembers the story, we tried to come to China about 13, 14 years ago, and we were silent for four or five years because we had to swap the entire team. We really messed up back then. And now the new team that's been in China has done very well, but we royally screwed that up the first time Apple tried to enter China, we didn't really want to talk about that. And so I think it's, it's challenging, no matter how big you think you are, that you're going to override a local culture. There has to be some middle ground. Yeah. The cool thing is that there's lots of things that are occurring now. So if we take a look at what China was 10, 15 years ago, so things like intellectual property rights, things about valuations, there's now a, a much more open, I would say, open uh, sharing of information than there was. And it, I think there's a lot of things happening every day. Uh, another question before I start to tie off, because we're almost timed out. One more question, if anything. Okay, then what I'm going to do is, with the two minutes we have left, I'm going to say whatever it is that you want to talk about in defense of scaling. Laura, go. In defense of scaling? In support of scaling. <laughs> oh. uh, to, to say <laughs> great for scaling. Not scaling. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. Don't grow. Yeah. Um, okay. I think like as as we s started scaling the business one one the most important thing that I did for myself and my co-founder was to get an executive coach like to get someone to help and support me along the way and I am very like that's the one piece of advice I give every first time CEO or founder like get yourself someone who can support you someone you can vent to someone who you can trust entirely but that executive coach should have some sort of management experience or CEO experience mm -hmm. if possible and some sort of psychology background. So it's really a mix between like coach and psychologist. It's excellent. I can only recommend it. Great. Steve. I, I would agree with that. I was very fortunate to have a, have a great coach as well. I think over and above that, I think the key thing is just to focus on the reason why you started the business, which is to address a customer pain. Uh, so as you scale, keep focused on how you're addressing that customer pain. Don't just scale for the sake of scaling, um, because investors say or whatever. Just focus on how you're solving the customer. We lost sight of that a little bit. So focus on the customer. Great. I, I love this advice. For me, it was the, re, the undoing of the training I had from being in San Francisco. It was recognizing that just trying to tackle the market, which most of this growth type investing, especially in the VC community, is about creating a 100-year business in 10 years or being the number one in an entire market at all costs. That shit's bullshit, right? Like, that is not how the real world works. It never has. It will never be the majority of how companies are built. 99.99999% of all companies will be profitable, not scalable, organically growing businesses. So don't get hung up on that. Know what's right for you and your business model. Like you said, know that your investors are aligned with your vision and don't get forced into a business model by the hype and the media or by an overbearing investors or the ecosystem that's telling you that that's what's right. Do what's right for the problem you're solving, the customer you're addressing, and for your DNA, you and your co-founders, do what you believe in. Do what you believe in, do what's right. You heard it from Laura, Stephen Bay. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Thanks, everybody. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.